Hello and welcome everybody. It's Matt from MTG Gaming Bob. Today I've got a bit of a deck tech for Volo, the itinerant scholar. This was the random Baldur's Gate commander card that I got. Um, Wheel of Fortune or whatever you want to call it. Randomly selected for me from the, uh, the Jajam uh, league that they have going on right now. At first, I was pretty uh, disappointed actually. I even put in their uh, Discord. I was like, oh, what a boring, what a boring commander i don't know i just felt i felt like it'd be boring i felt like it'd be like uh, you just it's it's just stupid you just draw cards i'm like like i mean you know that sounds now that i say it i don't know why for some reason it just wasn't maybe it was because it was blue to my in my mind i was just like I, i'm not another blue commander i had a blue one last last month and for some reason i just had a negative reaction but anyways so now i love him i've played him for the first week so far i've played him in in testing and actually he's pretty he's pretty badass so I'll go through the deck. I just I selected Master Chef for the background, but let's uh, let's read the cards and I'll go through and I'll kind of give you the deck tech of what uh, what each cards in. Basically, the, the main goal of the deck is to play a bunch of cheap one drops, zero drops, or two drops uh, to get entries into his journal, and then you're able to draw a bunch of cards by just tapping two and tapping himself, and then you draw a bunch of cards that way, and you find your win con that way, whether it be uh, Walking Ballista or the laboratory maniac and there's kind of an engine just on volo himself for laboratory maniac so that that's why i picked them thassa's oracle is banned so it can't be thassa oracle it has to be laboratory maniac uh in the league that is so that's what we're working with i didn't initially want it to be really necessarily a, a com combo deck but it just kind of is easy you know and it actually is really really fun kind of deciding which creature to put in basically i just went to scryfall and i just selected in the commander colors green and blue and colorless uh what what creatures are zero one and two mana cost and i just kind of went through and just kind of picked all the creatures that sounded good and I accidentally made like a lot of comboy things not like comboys in like i should say more synergistic than comboy but anyway any rate let's read uh volo and see where it goes from there and kind of just i'll just read each card and kind of explain each one so Volo, itinerant scholar. When he enters the battlefield, create Volo's journal. A legendary colorless artifact token with hexproof. That's important. Hexproof is nice. Uh, and whenever you cast this creature, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Whenever you cast a creature spell, you note one of its creature types that hasn't been noted for this artifact. Uh, so basically you have like a dry erase or like a pen and paper and you write down one of the creature types. So for instance, Volo, he's a human wizard. You can pick either human or wizard. And if you were to recast him again for some reason and the journal's still out there, um, you can say, you can pick the other one that you didn't pick. You can't pick the same one twice. It doesn't add like a new entry to the journal. Uh, so for two colorless and tapping Volo himself, not the journal, draw a card for each creature type noted for target permanent you control named Volo's journal. And then of course it has choose a background. I don't know what's gonna, is next gonna be the previous? So Master Chef, this is just to pick another color. Uh, at first, I didn't really see any synergistics with the card itself, but it turned out that it actually is way more synergistic than I planned. Uh, it was, like I said, it was literally just to pick green because green has ramp and, you know, blue and green, semi good combination. So it was either this one or the led by giants, I think is what it's called. Basically, it makes your commander a 10-10. It's just kind of like, nah, that's kind of whatever. So what this one does, Master Chef... It's a legendary enchantment background. Commander creatures you own have. This creature enters the battlefield with an additional 1-1 one, one counter on it. That's kind of whatever. Who cares? But the other thing is, is other creatures you control enter the battlefield with an additional 1-1 one, one counter on it. And that's going to be relevant, actually, for a decent number of creatures. Uh, so, Arbor Elf, I'm just going to kind of... Bree if they're if they're just like mana dorks, then they're just going to be mana dorks. I'm just going to get a breeze past them. Not many of the mana dorks have anything besides just ramping. So notably, each of the Mana Dorks do have multiple creature types. I think the majority of them do, so that's helpful. So just Mana Dork here, uh, Elf Druid, Beast Whisperer. Because we're running so many cheap mana creature, or cheap cheap just creatures in general, like 0, 1, and 2 drops, Beast Whisperer actually becomes pretty insane. Um, it is two creature types, which is helpful, and it's a fairly, fairly good draw engine. Oh, also, uh, this is limited to $100, just so you're aware. It's a budget deck. Boreal Druid, again, just a Mana Dork with uh, Elf Druid. Again, for pretty popular creature type. Uh, Costa Caterpillar, it is an insect. There's only one other insect in the deck, and uh, this is mainly just to have a little bit of removal on, on a creature body that will trigger a journal entry, which is nice. And it's cheap. Cloud of Fairies, uh, this is just a, a basically a free 
journal entry. It's a fairy, so you summon it and it's, you know, two mana and it untaps two lands. You could run, and it's possible that I do change this. I haven't done it yet, but maybe this next, um, this next budget month or next budget week, you get 50 bucks extra per week. Maybe I'll add in the land that uh, bounces a land and you get it taps for two mana. So this would be like a, a ramp a little bit. That could be a thing. Uh, but other than that, it's got cycling on it, which I think because of Volo being the way Volo is, I think I'd rather just cast it with Volo on the field, but I could see myself cycling it in a, a rare situation. Uh, Coiling Oracle, uh, Snake Elf Druid, three different uh, types. Snake, not that popular. I think there's only one or two other snakes in the deck. So Elf Druid is pretty popular, but Snake, not so much. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, you reveal the top card if it's a, of your library. If it's a land, you put it onto the battlefield. Otherwise, you put it in your hand. Um, there is some bouncing in the deck, so because it has three creature types, it's helpful to be able to turn uh, on more entries into the journal and also get that benefit of it entering in the battlefield. Cryptic Trilobite. A lot of these cards, you guys are like, like this, this, I, the, the thing I love about this deck the most is that like so many of the cards are like, what the crap? I didn't know. I, I didn't know about half of these cards. Uh, so it's a trilobite, which no other creature type in the deck has trilobite, so that's helpful. It's XX, uh, so you have to cast double mana to get so two mana is a one one counter on it. So when it enters the battlefield, it enters the battlefield, X one one counters on it, and you can remove a one one counter on it, and you can add two colorless mana. You can spend this mana to only activate abilities. Well, conveniently enough, two mana, two colorless mana, is what's needed to tap Volo. So with the Master Chef, you can actually cast this for zero. It'll still come in the battlefield with one, a 1-1 one, one counter on it, and it's a free activation for Volo. So it's a free entry to the journal. It's a free entry activation for Volo to draw cards. Um, and if you don't want to crack it right away, you actually can, after the first turn, you could pay a mana, tap it, put a counter on it, remove a mana to activate Volo. So then it becomes this, like, it turns Volo's activated ability from two mana to one. And that actually is pretty, pretty useful. So this is actually a pretty good card for this deck, funny enough. Uh, Elvish Mystic, just Elf Druid, Mana Dork. Endless One, this is just a free creature. It's an Eldrazi. And again, you can even, you could cast this for zero anyways, because Volo only cares about cast. So even if you don't have Master Chef, you could just cast it for free and it'll just die. You don't really care too much about that. You're more concerned about just getting as many entries to the, to the journal as you can. And with Master Chef, it still comes into play with a 1-1 one -one counter, so it's a free 1-1 one -one creature, so it's basically like a Memnite or whatever, which we do run Memnite. Uh, Eternal Witness, this is just a human shaman. Uh, human, not that many humans in the deck. Shaman, there's a couple, but it also just reoccur if like something happens to one of your combo pieces, you can get it back from the graveyard. Like I did play against a mill deck in the first week, and like I was so afraid of one of the combo pieces being milled, so I was super ha uh, happy that I had Eternal Witness in the deck just in case. Uh, Fenhelm, uh, Finn, the Horn Elves, another Mana Dark, Elf Druid, Hellbreaker Horror. I struggle with this card, and I struggle with another the other card that's in here, another big creature. Uh, mainly because, okay, so it's a 7 drop, that's pretty late. And because this month isn't like a, it's only a little bit $200, the decks aren't like super combo-y. So you can run big things like this. It's not that big a deal. I think the biggest problem that I have with it is that because it is 7 mana, Every time I had it in my hand in playtesting and in uh, the actual real game, I never wanted to cast it because it's so expensive. I mean, you can you can hold up seven mana and like wait till it comes around, but you're like delaying so much because everything is so cheap. You want to be playing the one drops to like increase your volo count, your journal count, but yet you've got this seven drop that you want to be able to cast. And like, if you do land it and it does hit the field and you're able to cast all those one drops or two drops, it's probably worthwhile because you can, bounce a lot of things um but yeah i don't know i just struggle with it because it's so expensive i might just switch out this and the nezahal for the peregrine drake and um dead eye navigator combo just because they're more impactful like infinite mana is just more impactful than bouncing a bunch of stuff kind of i don't know so whole horror seven mana flash it can't be countered which is cool and then whenever you cast a spell, you choose up to one. You either return target spell you don't control to its owner's hand. So like any spell you, it's kind of a countering it. It like, it just completely negates it. So if they cast like a five drop creature, you can bounce that back to their hand and they just lose the mana. They don't cast the creature and it just goes back to their hand. If they can recast it again, if they have enough mana, then sure they can recast it. 
Um, but you can, if you have another instant spell or another instant creature or whatever, you can just bounce that too. Uh, same thing with the returning non-land permit to its owner's hand. You can bounce things that are affecting you in a bad way, um, like an enchantment or an artifact or whatever, non-land. Um, so there are, it's, it, there is a lot of usefulness to Hallbreaker Horror. I just find myself not wanting to spend the seven mana on it when everything else is so cheap. Maybe that's, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Let me know in the comments out of curiosity. What do you guys think about Hallbreaker Horror? Is he busted? Am I just like, am I, should I just cast him? You know, just wait till end of turn. If the worst comes to worst, I have to do something like a counter spell and then tap the, the Volo to draw some cards. I don't know. Instead of playing Hallbreaker, but it just feels like you're wasting your entire turn when you just pass your turn. I'm not used to that kind of play. I don't know. Uh, Incubation Druid, this guy is just a fairly, it's a fairly simple mana dork. However, with Master Chef on the field, it becomes a two mana, three producing mana source. Because it'll come into play with the mana, it'll come into play with a one one counter from Master Chef, and then it can tap for three mana of any type, which is actually a pretty, well, of any land you control. So that's pretty cool. Uh, you don't have to pay the adept cost if you get, if you play it when Master Chef's on the field. So I, I really like that. And it's an Elf Druid, like I said, pretty common. Uh, Merfolk, Merfolk, there's like two or three Merfolks in the deck at the moment. Uh, but this just allows you to untap, well, another permanent, but mainly like Volo and, um, I mean, you can use it to ramp a little bit as well. It is kind of a mana dork as well. It can untap uh, land, it can untap um, soul ring or whatever. There's there, it, it is a ramp, but it also can allow you to untap Volo to draw some more cards, which is nice. There's a lot of different ways to untap Volo. Uh, Cross and Wayfair, this is just a super cheap mana dork that allows you to ramp by playing a card from your hand because you're gonna be drawing so many cards from volo the odds of you having a land they're pretty common so you can pay the one green it's a druid you say druid obviously oh it's a human druid actually i need to note that actually this is important because the, there's not that many humans in the deck but having it be two different creature types a human is actually super important i need to i need to make a mental note of that because on the card it just says druid okay uh but yeah it allows you to sacrifice him so you're just you're just playing it for the volo entry and then you sack it and uh put a land in here in your place so it's kind of free a lot of the stuff is free basically laboratory maniac this is just the win con for the, one of the win cons for the deck uh ideally you draw a bunch of cards with volo you have a bunch of ways to untap volo so like it's not too uncommon to get the volo journal entry up to like eight to ten so you really only need to do that activation about seven to eight times in order to like draw your entire deck by the time you're able to win with lab maniac and even if you don't have one of the ways to have in unlimited can size Ditching the card you don't need is kind of like whatever. It's like if you were able to like draw 20 cards and pick like the best seven, that's still a really good ability to be able to do. Like it, it, it feels bad to discard cards, but in at the end of the day, there's going to be enough. Hopefully I'm going to add enough like unlimited hand size cards that hopefully prevent that. But even if it doesn't, it's still really, really strong. Uh, but yeah, Lab Maniac says if you were to draw a card while your library has no cards in it, you win the game instead of losing. Normally you would lose. You, you win this in, in this way so ideally you would play this typically the, the turn you're going to win you then you play you don't just play this all willy-nilly you play this literally when you're going to win so when you have your most of your deck in your hand if you're drawing a bunch of cards with volo um like i said you just hold this into your hand hold your combo pieces until you're ready to win and have some counter spells to back up any removal uh Lanaware elf just elf druid mana dork mem knight free he's a construct so good journal entry uh, it is a 1-1, one, one, who cares, but it's mainly just for the free creature, free journal entry when you have Volo on the field, which allows you to draw more cards. Uh, Merc Fiend Liege. Actually, I mean, it's a really, really strong ability, and it allows you to draw, like, crazy amounts of cards. It's kind of like a Seedborn Muse, but for 60 cents in this deck. Um, but basically, so he gives you all your green creatures 1-1, one, one, all your blue creatures 1-1, one, one, 5 mana uh, for a 4-4. Four, four. He's a horror. I don't think there's any horrors in the deck, so that's nice. So it's a different creature type. And then he has untap all green and or blue creature cr uh, creatures you control during each other player's untap step. So Volo is a tap ability. He's a creature. He's blue. So he'll untap. Any mana dorks you have, they'll all untap, so they can actually pay for Volo himself. Uh, all your mana dorks can pay for the Volo activation. So you really, at the end of the day, you could be drawing with just Merc Fiend on the field, Merc, Merc Fiend on the field, and a couple mana dorks and Volo. You could be drawing five to ten per turn of your opponent's turns, and you get back to your hand, and you have like thirty or forty cards in your hand, and that's not too uncommon to be quite honest. So you're super, super good. It's not as good as Seedborn Muse, um, but for a budget deck, it's insane. Could this come out for Seedborn Muse? Sure. 
I, I have more budget this month, this uh, this week, an extra fifty bucks. I might make the switch. We'll see. That's a Hall Primal Tide. This is one of the other cards I was telling you about uh, removing for most likely Peregrine Drake or Dead Eye Navigator. It's seven mana for a seven seven. Can't be countered like the other one. You have no max hand size, so that's nice. Whenever an opponent casts a non-creature spell, you draw a card. In this deck, the drawing is kind of like whatever. Like, is I don't know. My, my Volo just stayed on the field the entire game, the, the first week. Like, nobody killed him. Like, and if they did try to kill him, I had plenty of counter spells in my hand because I was drawing so many cards. So, like, having this, he doesn't do anything. Like, if, you're, if your whole point of the, the, the game is to win by Laboratory Maniac or walk, Walking Ballista... It's kind of like, do I really need this big, dumb, dirtly dinosaur at seven mana cost? It's not Flash, so it's not like, it's not like the other card. I mean, I just in this deck, I don't know that it's needed. It's probably gonna come out, um, like a ninety-nine percent chance I'm gonna remove it. So, no, no, no. Uh, it is cheap, so like in the first week I wouldn't be able to fit it in, but now that I have the extra fifty bucks, yeah, he's gonna go away, I think. Uh, Ornithopter. This is, uh, you know, just a free and journal entry. It's a Thopter, which is nice. It's an O2 Flyer, which is nice. Uh, with Master Chef, it becomes a 1-3 Flyer, so it blocks Flyers. That's pretty helpful, and it's free, so free draw. Phyrexian Walker, same thing. Uh, zero mana for a 0-3. This is a Phyrexian Construct. There are Constructs in the deck, but I don't think there's any Phyrexian, so you'd pick Phyrexian. And it's a free journal entry, and it is a free blocker as well if people attack you. Uh, you don't care about your creatures dying. Once they, once you cast it, even if it gets countered, it doesn't matter. Because journal, the journal says once you cast the creature, you know one of its creature types. So it's perfect. Uh, Kyrian Ranger. This one is one of those things that allows you to untap your Volo a bunch of times. It is just one mana. It's an Elf Ranger. A Ranger, I, there's no other Rangers in the deck. So that's helpful. So you pick a Ranger all the time. And it's a 1-1. One, one. Return a force you control to its owner's hand. Untap target creature. Activate only once a turn. So you would tap the mana for the forest, and then you would bounce it back to your hand and then help pay for Volo's cost. Uh, but then also untap Volo to be able to redraw again. You typically only do this when you're like pretty far ahead and ramping, and you want to maybe you don't have a land to drop a land to play for turn. So you can tap two, draw a bunch of cards, return a forest, untap Volo, tap two to draw a bunch of cards again and dig for that combo piece and, and, and try to win that way. Or even just get card advantage, uh, get extra lands to play with uh, all kinds of other, you know, the abilities we've looked over so far. So just a nice little untap and it's cheap. Oh, and it has a relevant creature type and it's only low mana cost. Uh, Reclamation Sage, this is an interesting one. It's an elf shaman. There's not too many shamans, but there is tons of elves. Um, but yeah, shaman is a relevant creature type. Three mana, two, one. When it enters the battlefield, you may destroy target artifact or enchantment. Uh, obviously, you need some removal. There are some enchantments or, or artifacts that can ruin your day. Um, so having a removal is nice. And having a two different creature types is nice. Also, it is an elf. An elf is important for a creature later on. Sakura Tribelder, uh, two mana. It's a snake shaman. Like I said, there's not that many snakes and shamans. And this ramps you. So this is a fairly cheap journal entry. Um, a rare creature type, a rarer creature type than like elf or druid, and uh, of, co of course it ramps you as well. Uh, it's a blocker if you need it to block. Uh, when you play it, you can wait around obviously until it's just about to be your turn, uh, block anything, and then sack any response or whatnot. Well, uh, you know, just nice little stuffs. Uh, Sakura Tribe Scout. This card is nutty. Uh, it's a snake shaman scout. I don't think there's any other scouts in the deck, so you'd obviously always pick scout. And it's just tap. You may put a land from your hand into play. Uh, it's it's just super super good with Volo you're almost always going to be drawing a billion cards so just being able to play two lands a turn is, uh, is is pretty far up the priority list I'd say and it does everything that you want the deck to do it's only one green it's a 1-1 one, one, who cares but the snake shaman scout three different creature types um, it's just it's just great yeah, it's just more ramp scavenging ooze was something that I initially didn't put in the very beginning until like the last minute and it was funny because i was playing with a group of friends doing some play testing for this deck and i was like man graveyard if you don't interact with the graveyard no no to be to be fair i was playing with like decks that were like you know thousands of dollars they were like anywhere between 800 to 2000 3000 like these decks were way above this however i did win one of three games so like the deck can win against like these high punching game like the, these these archetypes uh, but yeah, I was just thinking, I'm like, man, if I don't have a way to interact with a graveyard, then I'd be pretty bad. So at the last minute, just before our, uh, the game on this past uh, Saturday, 
uh, I was like, I need to put, oh, scavenging ooze. Scavenging ooze is only 29 cents, so it's super cheap. Two mana, two, two. It's a ooze. I don't think there's any other oozes in the deck. So, you know, journal entry, that's important. And then it just has as an ability, uh, whenever you want, it doesn't have to tap or anything, so you can do it right away. Uh, one green, exile target card from a graveyard. If it's a creature card, you put a one one counter on scavenging ooze and you gain a life. So like I said, you just need ways to interact with the graveyard at any rate, even if there's no, even if you don't need to, gaining the life and removing creatures from the graveyard just as good. Even if you're picking your own, there's like very little interaction with that I do with my graveyard. So even if I get rid of a bunch of my own creatures, I'm still gaining the life. I'm still getting a big, big blocker. Um, very rarely am I ever gonna try to swing at somebody and try to like kill somebody with damage. Cause that's just, you know, that's just, that's boring. Do it the, the old fashioned combo -y way. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, he's a really good card. I shouldn't have to sell scavenging news. He's, he's very solid. 30 cents is like insane to me why it's so cheap, but eh, it is what it is. Uh, Shrieking Drake, one blue, one, one. It's a Drake. Uh, there are no other Drakes in the deck, not at the moment, but there will be Paragine Drake. I'm pretty sure that's a Drake. It says Drake in the name. Uh, but it's, you know, I've been misled before. <laughs> anyway, so it's a one, one flyer. When it enters the battlefield, sorry, when it comes into play, which is basically, yeah, it enters the battlefield. Return a creature you control to its owner's hand. You can return itself to its owner's hand. Um, you can return any other enter the battlefield effects that you want to rebounce. So for instance, Reclamation Sage, if you want to rebounce Reclamation Sage to replay it, um, with the Summon Drake, you'll get the, you know, the journal entry. You'll bounce the whatever creature you want. Like I said, like something like Reclamation Sage is really good uh, because it allows you to recast Reclamation Sage again to destroy another target enchantment or whatever. And there are other enter the battlefield effects like Coiling Oracle is really nice to have uh, for, for Peregrine or Shrieking Drake. Or, like I said, if worse comes to worse, if you're just trying to get the journal entry, uh, really early on, you could just play it and just bounce itself. And it's just a free journal entry. Well, a one blue mana cost journal entry. Uh, Sadisi's Faithful. This is basically the same exact thing as I just said, except for not a flyer, and it has an exploit thing, which allows you to sacrifice a creature when you cast Sadisi's Faithful, and it allows you to bounce another creature. You can bounce your own, or you can bounce somebody else's. Um, you know, it's just a uh, flexibility is nice. You don't have to exploit. You can just do Naga Wizard. Uh, you can just do it for the journal entry now for Naga Wizard. There's like no Naga Wizards in the deck, basically. Um, so that's really nice to have. Then you got Siren Storm Tamer. Really, really good card. So one mana for a 1-1 flyer. That's pretty decent. It's a Siren Pirate Wizard. Those are very relevant because I don't think there's any other Sirens in the deck. Um, there might be like one or two other pirates and maybe one or two other wizards. Uh, but having three different creature types is super helpful for Vol Volo's journal. But it also has a super relevant ability for one blue and you can sacrifice Siren Storm, Storm Tamer. Counter target spell or ability that targets you or a creature you control. That's pretty darn good for a one mana creature. That's all the things we want. This is what we want. We want dirty one mana creatures that just do these great abilities. And uh, that's one of them. Uh, Spectral Sailor, this is a uh, spirit pirate, uh, one mana, one one with flash that has uh, tap four mana draw a card, uh, three and one blue. I'll be honest, this is mainly only in there for the journal entries and because it has flash and flying and is a one one. The drawing is like, I mean, obviously if you have Volo, you're gonna always wanna use Volo over this because it's way cheaper and you'll, you're almost, almost guaranteed going to draw more cards in like 99% of the time. Uh, but we have a thing called first blood in our in our games where you get half a point for the league for getting the first damage done with a creature so this on turn one you can flash in just before you're about to take your turn and uh, flash it in and catch everybody off surprise and hopefully get first blood that's mainly why it's in there but it also is it's just a one mana one one fl uh, flyer with uh, flash and uh, spirit pirate so it's got the relevancy of the journal as well and being cheap. Uh, Stone Coil Serpent is really, really cool. So by himself, it's just pay X and it's an XX creature. Uh, it comes to the edge of the battlefield, XX counter, or X counters where X is in the mana that you pay. It has reach, trample, and protection from multicolor. Uh, also most notably because it's free um, with Master Chef, you can pay zero. It comes in a battlefield with a one, one counter and it's just a free creature and it's a snake. So that's uh, not too, there's a couple snakes in the deck, but not too many. And typically the other snakes have different creature types. You can choose the other ones and this can just be the snake. Uh, Tatiova, Benthic Druid, five mana for a three, three. Whenever uh, a land enters the battlefield under control, you gain one life, draw a card. And it's a Merfolk Druid. There's only like one or two other Merfolks in the deck. 
Uh, there's plenty of other druids in the deck, but not many merfolk. Um, this one is something I added in just because I'm like, I don't know. It's a, another way to draw cards that doesn't rely on Volo being out there. I have a feeling that like the more Volo becomes a target, the more he'll be killed. And if he just keeps getting killed, he's only three mana to start off with, but like he can get pretty expensive pretty quick. Now, I am playing a rampy deck, you know, but blue green is pretty rampy. Uh, but I could see a, a situation where it maybe doesn't get to the point where like it's worth recasting him over and over again. So having like alternative ways to draw cards and gain life and whatnot is not the worst. Uh, but I could see Tatiova being removed for like a more combo-y thing, like Paragon Drink, for instance. Um, maybe that's more beneficial. But either way, still a nice ability. Teardrop Kami, really, really good card. Um, there's not many other spirits in the deck, maybe one or two. One mana for a 1-1 one, one spirit, but it has a Sacrifice Teardrop Kami, tap or untap target creature. So you could play this, get the Volo counter, and then use the two mana to, or you sack this to untap Volo if you're trying to like really dig deep in the deck. And you can do this at any time, which is really, really nice. So you can kind of keep mana up until it's about to be your turn and then, you know, untap Volo to draw the cards. And uh, so you don't have to worry about like max hand size in that situation and stuff like that. Uh, Ugin's Conjurant, X mana for an OO. Uh, enters the battlefield with X one with counters on it. You can pay zero if you have Master Chef. It'll come in as a 1 1. If damage will be dealt to Ugin's Conjurant while it has a 1 1 counter on it, you prevent that damage and remove that many 1 1 counters. That doesn't really matter. It's mainly just a Spirit of Monk. There's no other monks in the deck. So you pick Monk. It's just a free journal counter. And uh, yeah, it's great. Even if you pay for zero and you don't have Master Chef on the field, it still is a free counter on uh, Volo. So it's basically like paying um well it's like paying nothing to get a counter to be able to draw another card so basically every one of these is like a free card draw walking ballista this is a construct doesn't really matter about the, what creature type it is when you play him it's going to always be when you're going to win the game with him when you go infinite mana there is one way at the moment to go infinite for infinite mana and uh that actually is how i won this the first week it's not too difficult to pull off when you're drawing you know the majority of your deck so it's not too unrealistic um but uh when it enters the battlefield it enters the battlefield x1 with counters on it you can pay four mana and put a, a counter on it and then you can remove a counter and you ping a creature or a player basically what you do is you use dramatic reversal and isochron scepter and you have some mana dorks as long as you have the ability to produce uh three mana or more um, with your things that aren't lands and you use dramatic reversal it'll untap itself with the ice crown scepter it'll untap itself and all your mana dorks you tap all your mana stuff you make you float all the mana you use the two mana to tap the ice crown scepter it creates the copy of uh, dramatic reversal you untap everything and then you make infinite mana that way you play walking ballista and you ping everybody to death um, that's the other way to win at this deck wirewood symbiote is just a one mana one one insect but you can return an elf you control to its owner's hand, unta uh, untap target creature, you can only activate it once per turn. So with it being an insect, it is a, I think there's only one other insect in the, in the deck, so it's a nice relevant, you know, creature type. But also there's a lot of elves in the deck that like want to be bounced. Um, for instance, like Reclamation Sage, being able to play Reclamation Sage, uh, destroy something, an artifact or enchantment, and then bounce it to untap Volo or a mana dork or whatever and um, re be able to replay it for some more value if you need to. It just adds, adds a lot of synergy in the deck. Uh, I think the, oh, um, Coiling Oracle is, a, is an elf as well. So you can bounce the Coiling Oracle. You can do this at the end of somebody's turn. You can bounce the Coiling Oracle and then just replay it at the start of your next turn uh, in your main phase and, and just, you know, like I said, gain a ton of value. It just has synergy. If you're running out of things to do, uh, and because the Coiling Oracle has three different creature types, you, it allows you to gain those three creature types for the Volo's journal. Every time you play it, you know one of its creature types that isn't on the journal, and it's it's just really, really good synergy. I think there's a couple other elves that, that have a bounce effect that are super helpful, but yeah, it's just it's super nice. At the very least, you're bouncing an elf to untap Volo to draw more cards, So and it's a free effect. Like, bouncing the elf is nothing. So you can do it at the end of somebody's turn just before you're about to play, draw more cards of Volo, all that kind of stuff. It's it's all at instant speed, and you can, only, you can do it once per turn, it doesn't mean it's it, you can do it once or every turn so you can do it my turn the next opponent's turn the next opponent's turn the next opponent's turn if you got enough mana and elves you could just sit there and draw a bunch of cards at the end of everybody's turn it's just it's just nice uh cultivate just goes and ramps you get some lands ponder just some draw and deck manipulation ramp of growth is just ramping for mana solve the equation it's just a, a basically just a search for dramatic reversal 
one of the combo pieces. Uh, and often you can't refuse is a really, really, really good counter spell. Um, giving countering a non token and a non creature spell for one blue is just uh, quite frankly, I think one of the strongest counter spells they've printed recently. The controller that the, of the spell that gets countered, they get two treasures, but like a lot of the times, like they're going to be holding up a kill spell or a counter spell. And you giving them the two treasures, if you're planning to win that turn, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter at all what happened. Okay. Uh, so one of the strongest counter spells in these kind of decks, the combo decks that they don't really care about the treasures that they're getting. This is just a dirty, cheap creature spell or uh, counter spell. Arcane Denial, a really, really good counter spell. It's counter any target spell. And uh, yeah, it allows them to draw two cards at the next end, uh, up upkeep, and you draw a card as well. Um, again, if you're planning to combo off and there is going to be no other upkeep, who cares? Beast Within, it's just a destroy target permanent. It's uh, pretty crucial to have the ability to remove something like an artifact or an enchantment or a creature that is just going to wreck your day. Having the instant speed removal is just super nice and you don't really care about the 3 3 creature. Brainstorm is just draw, but it also is deck manipulation. There's a couple ways to shuffle the library. Not that many, but like, even if it's, I mean, even if it's just a brainstorm, just drawing three and putting two back, um, it's not that, you know, it's just, it's still nice to have. Counter spell, just counter target spell. This spell, counter target instant spell. This is mainly for any kind of, you're going to counter off, you're going to counter, or you're going to combo off and you want to make sure you hold up enough mana. You want cheap interactions because Typically when you combo off, you're low on mana because you're doing, you're digging a bunch. You're like really trying, like on your turn, you're like, you know, tapping two for Volo, tapping two to untap something. You're you're like playing creatures to get more Volo adrenal entries. At the, at the end of the day, when you go to combo, you might only have one additional mana before like the everything else combos. So it's like having just one blue mana open, just available to counter whatever they try to interact with you. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just too good. And it's, just this is great dramatic reversal this is what i was talking about untap all non-land permits you control you put this on escron scepter and as long as you have as long as you can produce two mana you can do this in limited number of times so you could tap and untap your creatures a billion i don't know why you'd want to do this exactly um but you can do it i don't know you can unlimit you can unlimitedly untap volo so if you have like mana available say you have like six mana of lands you can pay for the untapping of Volo and it makes it free. So you can like pay up, you know, draw a bunch of cards, I guess. But uh, ideally you'd want th to be able to produce three mana so that you have unlimited mana. Cause it costs two to activate this crowd scepter. But on the mixture, this is a counter spell for instant and sorcery, but it also has transmute for two. Uh, transmute basically allows you to go tutor a permanent, uh, I'm sorry, just a spell, just a card. Just tutor your card for the same converted mana cost. And what do you know? Uh, you know, the Ice Crown Scepter is two mana. So typically it's there for the tutoring to go get the Ice Crown Scepter if you've already got the Dramatic Reversal. Uh, but if you don't, if you need to counter an Instant Sorcery as well, you can do that as well. Uh, Nature's Claim, again, just a instant way, super cheap. You don't really care that they gain four life because you're not going to kill somebody with damage. So it's basically just a one green destroy target artifact or enchantment. That could be pretty relevant if you're trying to prevent something that screws your day. Negate, just another counter spell, just cheap counter spell. Pongify, just uh, creature destruction, one blue. Again, you don't really care about the th the creature that they get, because your creatures are good enough. Like they're they're going to be like two threes, two twos, um, sometimes a three three, and they're going to be like, sh and even if you're taking three, who cares? Like it's just you know what I'm saying. Like it's just good to, good good creature destruction. Pull from tomorrow. I would actually say not to run this. I thought you would need creature. Or I'm sorry. I thought you would need draw, um, but Volo is good enough. I would probably just run something else. Uh, you know, the, the, you're never going to keep enough mana. You're never going to keep enough mana open for this to actually like be crazy. So this isn't needed. I thought it would be needed, but no. Just recast Volo. I mean, it's just if it gets removed, just recast Volo. Uh, this is the same as the uh, Pungify, but it gets you a different creature type, uh, or them a creature different different creature type. Uh, reality shift is an exile uh, nice nice that it's exile because some things are indestructible some things some things have uh, on die effects uh, sometimes they go to the graveyard and they, they do something or the or they can be reanimated or whatever um having an exile for two and manifesting sometimes most of the time the manifest does nothing so it's a pretty good removal spell 
Vitalize is super, super strong. Untap all creatures you control for one green at instant speed. So it allows you to untap all your mana dorks, untap Volo, draw a bunch more cards. Uh, for just one green, it allows you to do so much more. It's great. Arcane Signet, just mana rock. Ice Crown Scepter, this combos basically only with Dramatic Reversal. You can do, I mean, you could Ice Crown Scepter um, like a counter spell, but like it's just going to make the plays so strange because everybody's going to know what you have. Like they can see it on the field. They know you can counter anything you want. And it just becomes like a, this huge target on yourself. And then if you do that, the only way you could win is by drawing your deck with Laboratory Maniac. And realistically, I would just strictly use this for Dramatic Reversal. It's not really worth it for having um, enough counter spells to make it. I don't know. It just puts a big target on your back. Uh, just winning on the spot is much easier with that card. Just you, you play when you're about to ready to combo off, and that's it. Uh, Soul Ring is just this nice mana rant. Mana Rock. Uh, Swiftfoot Boots just gives protection for Volo. Ideally, you'd want this and potentially even um, Lightning Greaves. I'll probably put Lightning Greaves as well in here. Um, it is a little annoying to have uh, Shroud versus Hexproof. Uh, obviously, I'd rather have Hexproof because there are a couple of times that I'd like to untap, you know, if I want to target Volo and it says like untap target creature, you can't do that with the Greaves and that's kind of important. So it depends. I might not run Greaves at all. I think there's too many things to target in my deck that I want. Thought Vessel is just a nice mana rock that gives you no max hand size, which surprisingly is pretty important. You really don't want to discard if you don't have to. So you run like Thought Vessel and um, the land that does it the same thing. Freed from the Real is... I initially put it in here strictly for Volo. I was like, even if you're just paying one mana, one blue mana to untap Volo and then two to tap, that's tapping three mana to draw. Most of the time, it's like five to ten cards. Three mana to draw that many cards is still really, really good. But then I actually found out later on that with Incubation Druid, uh, if it has the one with counter on it, Freed from the Real is infinite mana with that. You tap for three blue, you use one blue to untap it, and then you can just do that over and over and over again. So there are another, there is another combo with Freed from the Real that I didn't really see at first, uh, like I said, with Incubation Druid. And, and you could put it on other things uh, other than Volo and Incubation Druid, but those are the main two targets. Instill Energy. This is basically a better version of Freed from the Real for Volo. Uh, you really probably wouldn't really want to put it on anybody else besides Volo, but it allows you to, on your turn, activate only during your turn and only once each turn. Um, for zero mana, you can untap target creature, enchanted creature, sorry. So you enchant your Volos, uh, and then it gives it haste, first of all, as well. That's super helpful. So if you play your Volo, play this, it allows you to use his tap to draw that turn, which is super nice. Uh, and then now we're getting into the lands, commit towers just for a land. A lot of groves, just dual land, lots of forests, lots of islands. Reliquary Tower is the one with no max hand size, which is super nice. I want more effects that get that. I think there's one other artifact that it's like three mana, taps for any color, and it gives you no max hand size. I might run that as well because, um, you know, like I said, ideally you don't want to, you don't want to discard cards if you don't want to. And uh, having no max hand size is one way to do it. Uh, more dual lands, and this is the considering section, I believe. Yeah, he's not in the deck. So that's the deck there. I do have a considering section. If you want to check it out, I'll leave, I'll leave the link of the, the deck in the description. Thanks for watching everybody. I'm gonna have like another update. I'll probably just do a update at like $100 and then update at the max limit, which I think is gonna be at 250 at the end of the month. Then I'll give like a, maybe a progress on like what I've done. The, the games I'm gonna try to make go live, you can watch the games live or you can watch the videos later on when they're, you know, when it's no longer live or, or whatnot. Anyways, thanks for watching everybody and uh, see you next time.